Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work has been done to improve accessibility to prescription wig provision for those affected by hair loss. Minister Jenny Minto. Government knows that the provision of wigs is important to many people who have been diagnosed with various forms of hair loss. The prescription of wig provision is dependent on clinical assessment and individual need, with decisions made by clinicians in consultation with patients. The Scottish Government issued advisory national guidance on wig prescriptions to all NHS health boards in 2011 and again in 2014 to allow them to deliver services that meet the needs of their local population. <clears throat> Marie McNair. I thank the Minister for that answer. My constituent currently receives real hair wigs. However, given the advancements of acrylic wigs, would like to try one of these instead. She advises that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has said if she makes this decision, uh, she would not be able to move back to a real hair wig pr uh, prescription should she wish to. This seems a bit harsh. Can the Minister confirm whether there are any plans to review this approach? to allow more flexibility in moving between the two wig prescriptions. Minister. I thank Marie McNair for raising this important issue in the Chamber. Having had friends who chose to wear a wig and another who volunteers at the Beatson, I've heard directly from them the benefit of being able to access wigs on prescription if, if <coughs> wished. The current approach is flexible, allowing the change of wigs from natural to synthetic. It is for NHS health boards to implement the guidelines, and I would hope that they would take a person-centred approach to this. Question number two, Carol Mockin. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact that any masterly of NHS capital projects would have on patient and staff safety. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Patient safety is a key strategic objective for the Scottish Government, and we are committed to ensuring that all health and care is safe, effective, and person centred. We will continue to support NHS staff uh, and their well being to ensure they can continue to deliver the best possible care. Uh, despite the real terms cut to the Scottish Government's capital budget, health boards have had their capital maintenance budget protected at 23 24 levels, which allow them to continue to invest £150 million in maintaining the existing estate and to work on reducing backlog maintenance. Carol Mockin. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The safety of our staff is of paramount importance. Without staff safety, we cannot deliver patient safety. They go hand in hand. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions he has had with the trade unions about the impacts of this delay on the workforce? And can he advise whether the government has assessed the impacts of the up and coming implementation of safe staffing on service provision? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the latter point, I had that uh, dis discussion with uh, staff side uh, trade unions last week in our regular uh, stack uh, discussions. Uh, I haven't had a, uh, the, the, the time uh, as yet to be able to have the direct discussions on the former part of our question, uh, but it's certainly something that in my ongoing engagements with uh, trade union representatives across NHS and social care, uh, I would expect to have those discussions. Uh, of course, we don't want to be in this position. We want to be investing in these capital projects. They are a necessity uh, in order to uh, see the NHS and social care services continue to make progress. Unfortunately, they are because of the financial reality that we face, where we've had £1.6 billion removed from our capital budget by decisions from the UK Government uh, and the increase of costs due to spiralling UK inflation. Michelle Thompson. <coughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. And the Cabinet Secretary correctly highlights the issues of cuts to capital expenditure by the UK Government. And I think there's a real sense now that people are understanding the real impact on people's lives of this cut. So can the Cabinet Secretary give any further insight into the discussions with the UK Government and emphasising the critical impact on this cut on the Scottish Government's capital expenditure budget? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, absolutely. I can. And Michelle Thompson is absolutely right that um, I, I think uh, the uh, the uh, years of austerity alongside uh, this particu these particular decisions uh, that have come through where we see £1.6 billion come out of our capital budget is having real-term 
uh, real-time impact and impact on, on people uh, and on our services. The Deputy First Minister uh, wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Jeremy Hunt, on the 23rd of February to outline the Scottish Government's priority ahead of uh, the UK Government's spring budget. In that letter, the Deputy First Minister highlighted that in addition to the block grant fallen by 1.2 per cent in real terms since 2022-23, UK capital funding is set to fall by almost 10 per cent, 1.6 billion between 23-24 and 27-28. Uh, so the Deputy First Minister has communicated a very strong message to the Chancellor that there is a clear need for increased investment by the UK Government in public services and by extension the economy uh, ahead of the next fiscal event. Question number three, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has conducted of the potential impact of the proposed non-domestic rates public health supplement on large retailers as set out in the 2024-25 budget. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. The announcement in the Scottish Budget 24-25 signalled the Scottish Government's intent to explore the reintroduction of a public health supplement for large retailers in advance of the next budget. In line with the New Deal for Business, we are committed to engaging early with all relevant stakeholders to ensure that any impact of any proposals on business is fully understood. Exploratory discussions have already started with business and other relevant stakeholders such as public health organisations and will continue uh, to ensure that considered and informed decisions can be made in advance of the 2025-26 budget. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I know that you are very aware of the very strong concerns that have been expressed by the Scottish Retail Consortium and also uh, your good self at stage two promised that you would examine the likely impacts on any such move. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, however, to recognise that those who are already liable for the higher property rate are paying a much higher rate on their comparable premises compared to elsewhere in the UK and that the imposition of a surtax would just widen that differential and undermine the ability of large Scottish retailers to remain competitive? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, as Liz Smith herself recognised, we uh, have been engaging very directly with a number of business organisations, including the Scottish uh, Retail Consortium. Uh, we will continue to do that. We have asked for uh, some information and evidence from the sector on what they regard uh, the impact to be. Um, and we will continue uh, to work with them through those uh, discussions in line with the new deal uh, for uh, business. And uh, those discussions so, fo so far have been very constructive. Question number four, Sarah Moyak. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that critical transport infrastructure is resilient against extreme weather events. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Transport Scotland's approach to climate change and resilience, uh, ACAR, was published in August 2023, setting out a strategic framework to secure a well-adapted future for Scotland's transport system. The ACAR provides our current approach to adaptation and strategic outcomes for road, rail, aviation and maritime transport networks to address the climate uh, key climate risks affecting Scotland's transport system. We continue to address known hotspots and look for opportunities to future-proof our transport networks so that they can meet the future challenges of climate change. Sarah Boyer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? It is clear that the effects of the climate emergency are now having a real impact on our roads and railways, and the numbers of storms and increased rainfall in October last year saw preemptive rail line closures for the first time. And those closures led the editor of Rail Engineer magazine, David Shearis, to comment, infrastructure that had shown itself to be resilient to the UK's past weather may now no longer be so. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline what discussions she has had with Network Rail on ensuring that rail infrastructure is resilient to climate change across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So over the next uh, five-year investment period, the Scottish Government has committed to invest £4.2 billion in the Scottish Rail infrastructure in line with our high-level output specification. The specification focuses on climate change adaptation and resilience as one of the strategic priorities and makes provision for enhancing the weather resilience and climate change adaptation strategy. I discussed this with Network Rail earlier this year in London and only this afternoon I'll be discussing the control period 7 which focuses, as I said, on climate change with Network Rail and the ORR. 
Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Failure by the Scottish Government to provide any cover for the MV Hamnavo during refit in January led to no service on Pentland first routes at various points over the two-week period during poor weather. So will the Transport Secretary commit to ensuring a replacement vessel is available on the Stromness Scrabster route in future to provide much needed resilience on this lifeline service? Cabinet Secretary. The constituency MSP uh, clearly communicated his concerns about risk in that period. Um, I was reassured that there was capacity issues met during that, that period, but as he knows, we're always looking at uh, increasing the freight opportunities uh, for the Northern Isles and will continue to do so. Question number five, Claire Hawley. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of the repayment of PFI and PPP debts on local authority finances. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. PFI PPP unitary payments have a significant pressure on local authority budgets. There are 38 ongoing local authority PFI PPP contracts. Up to £8.15 billion in payments on these contracts have been made up to this year, with a further £7.25 billion in payments to be made over the coming years. That is £15.4 billion of payments for local authority projects, with a capital value of £3.27 billion. Claire Hawhey. South Lanarkshire Council, the local authority for my constituency of Rutherglen, will be paying back around £40 million this year in disastrous PFI repayments, and that yearly figure will only rise over the coming decade. At the time South Lanarkshire Council entered into those contracts, Labour were in power at council level, Holyrood and at Westminster, and the £40 million that is being removed from South Lanarkshire Council's spending power this year is at a time when the council are proposing to close local facilities as well as cut free school bus provision. Can the Deputy First Minister assure me that although having to contend with Labour's toxic PFI legacy, which has failed to deliver best value for the taxpayer, this Scottish Government will never return to the disastrous PFI model? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, let me say I can absolutely give Claire Hawkey that assurance because PFI was an expensive mistake. And even if the PFI and PPP models of the Tories and Labour were an option, we totally reject them as being extremely poor value for money. PFI simply did not deliver the best value for the people of Scotland, and we are still paying for the legacy of, in the main, Labour's mistakes. Question number six, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent ONS data, what assessment it has made of the impact on Scotland's public finances of the UK entering a recession in 2023. Minister Tom Arthur. The news that the UK has entered recession represents the latest failure of the UK Government. This will compound the economic challenges that households, businesses and we in the Scottish Government are facing. Last week I wrote to the Chief Secretary, to the Treasury and copied in the Chancellor, urging her to provide additional investment in public infrastructure and services in his forthcoming budget. But the reality at the moment is that our UK Government capital funding is set to fall by almost 10 per cent in real terms between 2023-24 and 2027-28, making it impossible to provide the investment needed to underpin future sustainable economic growth. Jackie Dunbar. It is clear that economically illiterate Westminster policies, including Brexit, austerity cuts and cutting labour force migration in key industries, have set the UK on the path to long-term decline. It is vital that future action is taken to support families facing financial pressures at this difficult time. We know that most of the powers to tackle poverty and the cost of living remain reserved. Can the Minister provide me with any update regarding the Scottish Government's engagement with the UK Government in terms of steps which it should take in the upcoming UK Budget to support families facing pressures? Minister. The Deputy First Minister last week wrote to the Chancellor and urged him to provide further targeted support for people who are struggling. This must include an essentials guarantee, which would provide the most basic of necessities and benefit 8.8 .8 million families. We have again called for the abolition of the two-child limit, benefits cap, young parent penalty and universal credit, and the bedroom tax. We are doing what we can to mitigate these damaging policies 
However, we cannot mitigate everything. And the Chancellor needs to take action to support vulnerable families in his budget next week. Question number seven, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will make a long-term commitment to retain the Adrosan Brodick Ferry Service. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Yes, the Scottish Government maintains its commitment to ensuring two services to Arran are fit for the future and the business case with cost estimates for Adrosan Harbour redevelopment currently being prepared must be as robust as possible to help secure necessary and required funding uh, from all funding partners, North Ayrshire Council, Peel Ports and Transport Scotland. And can I also, President Officer, use this opportunity to acknowledge and understand the significant difficulties faced by the Arran community around operation of ferry services, which has been extremely challenging with severe weather disruptions and vessel outages. The MV Isle of Arran is currently operating a single service between Adross and Brodick, and there are no current capacity issues. Katie Clark. The Cabinet Secretary knows that there is currently a great deal of concern on Arran and in Adrossan as to whether Adross and Brodick will be the long-term route. Will she give reassurance to people in Adrossan and on Arran that it will be the long-term service, given that it is the quickest, most convenient route and the socio-economic importance of the ferry port to Adrossan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the point the member uh, has raised about the socio-economic case is really important, which is why uh, Transport Scotland officials will be meeting again next week with the North Ayrshire Council to ensure that that business case is as robust as possible. And under the auspices of Kenny Gibson, the constituency MSP, I met with a number of Aaron Ferry uh, stakeholder interests just last week to discuss these issues. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, President. Officer, what I did not hear in either of those two responses was a firm commitment from the Minister that Ardrossan will be retained as the primary route. The Scottish Government built a ferry which is not fit for purpose on that uh, vessel route. Uh, neither has it invested any money properly in Ardrossan Harbour since the 2017 campaign to save Ardrossan as the primary route. Can I ask for some firm commitment from the government this time that they are committed that the Arran to Adrossan ferry route will remain for the future? Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to, to that service. Uh, I would like to remind the member that it, uh, the Scottish Government are not the uh, Harbour Authority. The Harbour Authority are PO ports. And in order to uh, allow the Scottish Government to invest um, in any harbour that is not our own, that's a private entity, and the UK subsidy control measures will have an impact on what can or cannot be done in relation to such investment. A brief supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for meeting with myself and North Ayrshire representatives at such short notice to discuss this uh, very important issue. Can she advise when the final report on Adrossan Harbour from consultants Turner and Townsend and the structural report from Peel Ports are anticipated? Cabinet Secretary. The cost exercise report from Turner and Townsend is expected by the end of this week, which will then be shared with the project partners to assist with confirmation of financial packages for the project and to feed into the work on the business case. The structural report from Peel Supports Group is awaited, which is also essential to inform the business case work. Transport Scotland officials continue to engage with Peel Ports and other partners on this important matter, noting the urgency to develop the business case to finalisation. Question number eight, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with BT Group and EE regarding the proposed closure of its Greenock call centre. Minister Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I have written to the BT Group to express my concern about their decision and I've urged them to engage with stakeholders to consider all options to retain these jobs in Greenock. The Minister for Small Business Innovation, Tourism and Trade, Richard Lockhead, has spoken with representatives of EE and BT and urged them to keep all options on the table, including maintaining a presence in Greenock. The Minister also attended the Inverclyde Task Force on the 20th of February and discussed the proposed closure of the site with representatives from Inverclyde Council. The Scottish the Scottish Government will continue to engage closely with all partners uh, in Inverclyde as the situation develops. And I have followed up on that with an invitation to meet me, which was sent to them earlier this week, sent to the task force earlier this week, given my new portfolio responsibilities. Neil Bibby. I, I thank the Minister for that answer. Around 450 people are employed at EE's call centre in Greenock, which is set to be moved to Glasgow. In the past year alone, 1,000 jobs have been lost from the Inverclyde area uh, because of site closures, most notably that of Amazon and Gourock. 
Despite repeated calls for financial support, the Scottish Government has so far not provided a penny of support in response to job losses over the past year and has not responded to calls made by Inverclyde's socio-economic task force for more investment uh, over six months ago. So can I ask the Minister if the Government won't provide additional needed support now in the face of this job crisis, when will it? Minister. Uh, thank Neil Bibby for the. He has outlined uh, you know, successive closures and job losses in Greenock, and he is absolutely right to do so. What I am going to be doing is the, engaging with the Inverclyde, Inverclyde Task Force on all of those issues that he has mentioned and see if there is anything more that the, 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 uh, the government can do to assist in that matter. They are actually dealing with this on the ground. They are best pay, placed to, to, to get into the, the, the weeds of what is going on here and to liaise with the companies involved and try and retain some of the jobs going forward in Greenock that have been, you know, uh, um, that are currently in, in jeopardy um, as a result of decisions made by uh, private companies. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions.